I pretty much, I made this sort of practice of starting every abolitionist one-on-one -on -one talk with the reading of a passage of scripture from Isaiah chapter 1. And I usually just start reading that and everyone's like, oh, we've all heard this a million times. But it dawned on me while I was listening to Jeff teach, which has just been awesome, uh, he talked about the state of San Diego and kind of primed us like this is the city of sin and this is where people are and all this kind of stuff. I want to talk about sort of the state of the nation. And in particular, the state of the people in our nation and how they are dealing with the national sin of child sacrifice. Um, the subtitle of the talk was actually how treating abortion as sin changes the way we do everything. We as an abolitionist. How treating abortion as sin. Not thinking of abortion as sin changes everything or agreeing that abortion is sin or morally holding and agreeing that abortion is sin and murder changes everything. You know, how functionally, practically treating abortion as sin Individual sin and national sin changes everything. But for me, since the beginning of uh, AHA, since the beginning of uh, the reignition of abolitionism, um, since God, you know, woke me up of my own apathy, the passage which has been sort of at the forefront of like, this is your culture, this is your situation, and this is what you have to do. This is what you have to say, this is what you have to feel, this is what you have to believe, and this is what you have to push, has been Isaiah chapter 1. And I know we've all probably studied that quite a bit, but for those who are maybe new to abolitionism and haven't heard me rant on this particular passage, I'm going to open with, with just, just looking at Isaiah chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm going to jump around, but starting just the context, obviously, we are in Israel or Judah, and obviously... I'm not a prophet like Isaiah, right? But this is a prophet like Isaiah and God wrote this. And so we, st we still have the prophets, okay? And we have the word of God and I want to speak it. And I want to apply it to our current situation. So I'm going to read about the sinful nation that Isaiah was dealing with and submit it to you guys, okay? Isaiah 1, chapter 4 says, and this is from the ESV, pardon that translation. Verse 4, Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 4, no. Verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, laden with, burdened down with iniquity. Offspring of evil do, doers, children who deal corruptly, have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they are utterly estranged. The prophet is opening up to this sinful nation. The very first and foremost thing that's wrong with them, they have forsaken God. Okay? So forsaking God, what does that lead to? What's going on? If you look at verse 6, it says from the sole of the foot to the head, there's no soundness in it, the nation, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. It says Jeff was preaching earlier that every it's a nation full of violence and people are not doing anything about it they're just going about their their business now he mentioned that everyone's distracted with eating drinking being merry going on to the next sporting event the next entertaining thing watching 10 television shows they're distracted by entertainment that is true our nation is distracted by entertainment but there's also something else going on. If you it talks about the, how the country lies desolate in verse 7, that the land is being devoured by foreigners, that it's being overthrown. So basically, this is a this is a this is a country that is desolate. But not only do we have in, uh, entertainment and eating, drinking, and being merry, going about our business, ignoring the violence, we have look. In verse 11, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. This is a people that are practicing religion. Not a little religion. It's not like just some religious. There's a multitude of sacrifices. 
And God says to his prophet, I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, I'm in verse 12, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths, the calling of convocations, I cannot endure. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assemblies. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. Okay, so this is a very religious people. They're doing all the sort of like festivals and celebrations and they're, they're bringing bulls and goats and they're, they're practicing the sacrifices and God is actually saying, yes, I hate it. I can't endure your sol- when you gather together and get all solemn about these things. I can't endure it. 14, uh, into 14, they become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands as we do and as they did, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, multitude of sacrifices, multitude of hand, many waving your hands, many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. So we have the living God through his prophet saying, sinful nation of religious worshipers who are doing all the right things and sacrificing the animals and having the festivals. I hate your worship and I don't want it. I can't endure it. I don't even want to listen to your prayers. We'll get to verse 16 and 17 where abolitionism comes from. But just in case you're hard on hearing this, you live in a nation that is full of violence that is desolate, that is distracted, and is not doing much, if anything, to deal with this. It is a land that is being devoured by foreigners, and it is a land filled with churches, church buildings. There's one church, she's spotless, she's perfect, Christ died for her. I'm talking about church organizations, hundreds of thousands of church organizations who believe that this is the word of God. And in accordance with the word of God, meet and take communion and worship and pray and lift their hands and make many prayers. And in this nation full of religious people, image bearers, neighbors created in the image of God, little children are sacrificed Every minute of every day. That's the nation you live in. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Does anyone disagree? Does anyone think that the nation isn't full of violence? So what are we to do? People go to this passage when they're preaching about the atonement. They're preaching about Christ. This passage, like all other passages in the Word of God, are about Christ. But they go to this passage and they quote this sort of the blood of bulls and goats is not enough. Obviously, to appease the wrath of, the wrath of God, we're going to have to have um, Christ and his crucifixion. But what does the prophet say to his people in this nation? He says very clearly, for any five-year-old to understand, when you're facing a situation where evil's running rampant, what do you do? Verse 16, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. And plead the widow's cause. This is the prophet of God saying, this is what you do. It starts with you. You, people, repent. You, that's it. You first repent. I'm going to say it twice. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. This isn't admit that you're in need of a Savior and everything's good. 
This is washing yourselves. <coughs> the, the, uh, the analog today would be saying, I lived in a nation of violence and all I did was study systematic theologies two hours a day. I lived in a nation of violence and I studied apologetics. I lived in a nation of violence and I went to church all the time. I lived in a nation of violence and I put money in the offering plate. I lived in a nation of violence. I lived in a nation where the fatherless were being taken away to death every minute of every day and I failed to love them. I was sinful. I did not love my neighbor. And the reason I did not love my neighbor was because I had forsaken my God. The image of my God was being butchered down the street from my church. And I thought that was somebody else's special calling. I was wrong. I was guilty. Me and all my friends and all my Christian brothers and sisters have neglected the least of these, have neglected image bearers neighbors. We are sinful. I need to wash myself. And once you're washed, then you can go and remove evils. Remove them. This might make sense more towards the end of the talk. You can figure out, you can learn, learn, learn to do good. You can seek justice. You can work towards justice. That's an incremental thing, right? Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice. Establish justice for the followers. Plead the widow's cause. So this is the situation. Now that's usually where I stop it on this kind of talk. But that's not all. This is our nation. 